What's up, Military Millionaires? I'm your host, David Perret, and we are here with Alex Felice and Jordan Grummet, otherwise known as Doc G, which is actually, uh, it's kind of funny because he emailed me with his name and I was like, who's this guy? And then I realized it was Doc G and I was like, oh, I never knew his real name and we've known each other for a couple of years now. So that being said, he is the host of the award-winning Earn and Invest podcast, uh, which Alex and I have been guests on together, which is actually one of the more, the more fun podcast episodes I've ever recorded. And now the author of the book, Taking Stock, a Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth and Living a Regret-Free Life, which is available August 2nd. And uh, we're going to talk about that and some of the other life lessons here. But Doc, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Military Millionaire Podcast, where we teach service members, veterans, and their families how to build wealth through personal finance, entrepreneurship, and real estate investing. I'm your host, David Perret, and together with my co-host, Alex Felice, we're here to be your no BS guides along the most important mission you'll ever embark on, your finances. Vehicle one, you're clear to depart friendly lines. Run! Roger, Vic One, Oscar Mike. Hey guys, if you're looking to take your investing, business, life, or just yourself to the next level, then I have something for you. The War Room Real Estate Military Mastermind Group is a mastermind group that meets weekly in small groups of five to six people to help you hold yourself accountable and really experience that growth. But we also have a monthly guest speaker that we bring in, and we've had guest speakers that talk about mindfulness, taxes, we're bringing in somebody to talk about marketing. We bring in very specific topics that will adhere to very broad, any any kind of real estate investing or investing or entrepreneurship that you want to do, and will really help you out. We let you ask these speakers questions and get very personal with them. And then back to the small groups, weekly accountability for what you're trying to achieve and just being surrounded by like-minded people. And they say your network is your net worth. I know that's an overused phrase, but I recommend that you check it out. So just shoot an email to wrmastermind at gmail.com. Once again, that's wrmastermind at gmail.com. And we'll send you some more information. Thank you for having me. Uh, As I was saying before the recording, the fact that you have a no BS sign behind you as we record this is just, just makes it all the more better. Well, it'd be even better if I remember to turn off my actual main light, you know, ceiling fan and use the real lighting. <laughs> uh, so I've known you for like, I've known you for like five years now, bro. And it's been Doc G forever. I didn't actually know you were a doctor. I just thought it was like a nickname. And then I see Jordan Grummet, Grummet all over the internet and these things. So what do I call you? So I go by either Jordan or Doc. Back in the day when I started my blog, I wanted to be able to get granular about writing about finances. And my wife said, you know what? I really would rather not have your name out there tied to our money issues. So I started with Doc G just being a medical doctor that made sense. And G was for my last name. And that's how I kind of blogged and created my social persona. But as time went on, and especially when I wanted to write a book, I wanted to be able to use my real name and and connect my two personas. I had also blogged for years and years about medicine since 2005. So I had kind of this medicine social media persona under my real name. So I eventually wanted to merge everything together. That makes sense. Is that common? Like people that they blog anonymously, especially when they blog about money. But I think blogging in general is one of those things where you, you sort of get used to it and you sort of, as you get better, you accept, you accept the, uh, both the benefits and the consequences that come with it a little more organically. And then you're like, eh, fine, it's me. Yeah. I mean, I think when you first start doing it, you're like, wow, this gives me freedom to say and do what I truly believe without worrying about blowback or consequences. Being a doctor, you know, I had the also issue of worrying about malpractice. So if you're on the internet constantly talking about money and then you get sued for malpractice as a physician, they have some ammunition to go after your personal funds. And so that was also another reason why it's kind of like, eh, you know, should I be anonymous or not? Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that would that would put a different you, different spin on you it. You are Doc I G kind of to me forever, just FYI. Yeah, same. <laughs> and and to ma- and to many people, I think it's a moniker that that hopefully has become quote unquote beloved. So uh, that is fine with me. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good one. You did, you did well. So all right, so uh, give us the overview of who Doc G is and how we got to this point in life. Right, we we know you you blog about finances. We know you're a hospice doctor, but. Like what, what brings you up? What's the backstory? 
So basically, my father was a doctor. He was a cancer doctor, and he was well-known in the community. And he died suddenly when I was seven years old. He had a brain aneurysm. He got a headache one day and collapsed and died while he was actually rounding at the hospital seeing patients. And this really bred in me this idea of I'm going to become a doctor like he was. I'm going to fill his shoes. That became my identity and propelled me all through college, medical school, eventually residency. And I became the thing that I most wanted in the world, the thing that was more important to me than money or anything else. And as I started practicing, I got burned out. I realized that medicine wasn't what I thought it would be. There was a lot more paperwork. There was a lot more taking care of people when you couldn't help them and you couldn't fix their problems. And there was a lot of really late nights and weekends. I started looking for a way out in my mid-30s, early 40s. And I went to my financial advisor and he kind of said, eh, you've got a bunch of years before you have enough money to retire. I went to my accountant who happened to be my mother at the time. I said, you know, when can I retire? She's like, when you have $10 million saved up, I didn't have $10 million. Uh, This guy, Jim Dolly, the white coat investor wrote a book and I was doing medical blogging at the time. And he wanted me to review his book on my medical blog. He sent it to me. I read it and I discovered personal finance and financial independence. And I realized at that moment that I was actually financially independent instead of being overjoyed. I actually had a panic attack when I realized that although I had enough money to quit right away, medicine was the only identity I really connected to throughout my life. And now I was talking about walking away from that as well as walking away from this little connection I had left with my father who had died when I was seven years old. Over the next years, I started writing about personal finance, podcasting about personal finance And I realized that being a doctor was an identity that I'd worn for all these years, but it didn't fit me very well. What really did fit me was being a communicator, a guy who had these great conversations that I love to create either through writing or podcasting. The only part of medicine I wanted to hold on to was hospice care, which was dealing with the terminally ill. And as things happen, as I got deeper into communicating and podcasting and writing it and deeper into hospice at the same time, I realized that my two worlds connected and that the dying could really teach us things about life and money. And I found that my worlds collided and that's how the book came about. Bro, that is potent. And I'll tell you what, I think I know that there's listeners who identify with this. You know, because you wrote a book about it and I'm I'm sure it's going to do tremendously well. And I'm feeling it because there's so much overlap in, in like my life personally, not to make it about me, but I think there's, um, I've been saying now for, uh, um, uh, last probably two years where you make enough money and you realize money only solves money problems. And most real big problems are not money problems. Money don't solve the real big hard stuff. And the problem of identity, I just did this video with a guy yesterday who's a, um, he's a master woodworker now, but him and I were in the military and the people who leave the military, as David will tell you, when you leave, you have a big identity problem because the military gives you, and most of our listeners are military as one, as you could probably imagine, the military gives you an identity, a real good one, a purpose, um, a place in it, you know, a job, everything. And then you get out and you're like, wait, now nobody cares about my rank or my, you know, what I'm supposedly, you know, I'm a green beret or whatever, like nobody cares. Um, and so, you know, the, the trajectory I had is got out of the military and I started making a little bit of money. And then I realized that the money really doesn't bring you satisfaction. And it really is, there's an identity, there's an identity problem there. And it's, it's much harder to work out because it's, I, and you can, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. It's easier to sell books about how to make money than it is to sell books about, you know, philosophy, which is what, you know, is, it's sort of, I don't want to say it's more valuable, but it's valuable in a very different way. Yeah. So money is the easy part. And I hate to say this because we spend a lot of time teaching people how to deal with money. It may not be, it may take a lot of time and you might have to put a lot of energy to it, but you can work your way through how I make more money. I can get a raise. I can side hustle. I can change jobs. I can get an advanced degree. Like we can work our way through that. And so we love to go for those kind of things because it's low hanging fruit Our brains don't stumble on that, but our brains do stumble on identity and purpose. And I love that you brought up coming out of the military because for me, leaving medicine was probably very similar for you guys leaving the military. It was an identity that became such a part of who I was. I understood the traditions. I understood the rituals. I understood what I was supposed to do with myself, 
but they weren't making me happy. And so I had to step away. And I imagine anyone leaving the military after that's gotten ingrained into their soul, they may say that I don't want to spend the rest of my life in the military, but it's also the only identity they know. And there's this disconnect, right? And this is why, as you said, Alex, money is the easy part. We know the way forward when it comes to making money, but ask someone, how do you figure out your identity and purpose, especially someone who's never put any time or thought into it? And they'll look at you blankly. One thing I've kind of learned in part of my journey is I did it all wrong. I went after the money first. When I realized that my identity and purpose weren't being filled in medicine, I kind of tried to get the money thing in order. And I'm like, once the money thing is in order, I'll be happy. What I'm really trying to convince people is actually you got to figure out the identity and purpose first and then build the financial framework. And if you start building a financial framework after you have a sense of identity and purpose, the answers become really clear. It stops being about, oh, I need to retire in this number of years. It becomes more like, I'm doing this job right now I don't love. I need to make this certain amount of salary to live, but maybe I can take that extra 10% and start doing something I really want to do in between. And then maybe as I get successful at that and maybe make a little money at it, I can start doing 20% or 30% of my time doing that stuff of identity and purpose and start cutting back at the work-related activities that we don't love. So again, it's putting our finances in order based on identity and purpose as opposed to trying to get our finances in order so one day we can think of identity and purpose. I love this. We just launched an episode a couple of weeks ago with Mike McCarthy, one of the founders of GoBundance, and about talking about giving back. And one of the things that we hit on, and I think we've hit on this in two or three podcasts recently because Alex and I have been having a lot of conversations about this, but uh, th the amount of people who – get to wealth and realize that they dropped every other plate that was spinning on the way. And they're like, well, now I shoot, I gained a ton of weight when I got out of the military. Now there were some medical reasons for part of that, but there was a whole lot of stress and, and whatever reason. Nobody noticed because, David. Nobody and, noticed. And, Don't worry. <laughs> thanks for detracting from the moment. But like, you know, like there were a lot of plates that I dropped right in the pursuit of financial freedom and then i've achieved financial freedom and over the last like three months what i've been focused on is how can i cut out the things that make me money that don't fulfill me in order to focus on the things that still make me money but fulfill me even if it's less money like i just want to enjoy it again you know i've been joking online for months now that i'm trying to relearn how to have fun again <laughs> and it's, it's it's hard can can i add Oh, sorry. Can I just add one more piece to that? Because I think um, that there's two pieces of this puzzle. As one of them is, is like David said, is people get so engrossed in making money that they let the rest of their life sort of, um, they, they let it fall to the wayside. They, an, another part that I see is people who they find out how to make money and then they glue themselves to it because they don't know what else to do with their time. And they don't have, sometimes they don't have the courage. Sometimes they just don't have the exposure to go off and do things that are meaningful. So they're like, well, I built this business and, you know, my marriage is okay and everything, but I'm still unfulfilled. And it's because, they, it's not actually their purpose to to go off and make money. That maybe they're like you, a communicator or, an, or a creator or something else. Um, and so there's a. I just wanted to add because there's a couple of different ways that this problem manifests. Yeah, and in fact, in the book, I talk about both of them. I tell a story of a patient of mine named Liz who actually discovered personal finance, got her financial life in order but got so depressed when she didn't know where to focus her energy afterwards, she actually ended up getting into a car crash and dying. Literally, this actually happened. Um, so it can be dangerous. The other side of that is what a term I use called overdrive, which means that we're kind of spinning our wheels so much, but we're not going anywhere. And I use that term to describe what happens when we become so wealth focused that the money goals become the thing that we keep looking for. So we hit a money goal and as opposed to being happy, we get that hit of dopamine for a short period of time. And then we're like, okay, what's the next money goal? What's, what's the next peak? And we're literally just spinning our wheels, but we're not getting anywhere. We tend to forget that money is a tool, not a goal. And when we look at it as a goal, we end up spending our precious time. And we know time is precious, right? We end up spending our precious time making more of this tool, this potential energy, but never using it. And so that's where I think we often go wrong. David, when you were talking about 
things you do to make money that you like versus you don't like, one of those things that is way important to us and that we have almost no control over is time, right? Time passes no matter what we do. It's not a commodity. We can't buy it. We can't sell it. We can't trade it. There's only one thing we can do, which is if we look at life as a series of time slots, we can do a better job of putting things that are meaningful us to, meaningful to us in each of those time slots. And that's exactly what you were talking about. You were taking something that was less meaningful for you, even though it made money, and trying to substitute that out for another activity which may or may not make money but is more meaningful to you. And I would ultimately say that our goal is to build up enough of this money potential energy to fill as many of those time slots as possible with things that actually enhance our sense of identity and purpose. That's, that's not easy. (laughs) You gotta be thoughtful. I mean, it's something that you, you can't sleepwalk through. I, I, I love the sentiment. I do. And I, I feel like I, I have a voice here because I spent a lot of time on this, actually. I, I, I sort of hit financial freedom, a light v- variation of financial freedom. But the interesting thing about when you learn how to make money is that you, it's sort of like, well, I know how to do it now. So it's kind of boring. <laughs> if I need more, I can go make more. But now it's like, but okay, if I had more, I still don't know what I would really do with all my time. And then somebody emailed me today, a good friend of the, the, the three of us, actually, Sunita. And she said, hey, are you, how's life? You know, are you happy? And I'm like, oh. What a crazy word. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. You know, I don't know what that means. Uh, and that's another whole other, maybe that's a whole other problem, like happy, but um, it, certainly happy and meaningful and purposeful are, are not, the, are definitely not the same thing. Um, but the idea that, and you had said it to it earlier, like where you're like, hey, if you can quit worrying about the money problem and start focusing on the purpose and the meaning problem, then the money problem will sort of get easier. Um, it, it's a really... It, it really is the correct path forward, but it really is difficult because we we first we live in a culture that worships. I mean, I don't want to say capitalism; they worship consumerism. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just like you said, like, "Hey, make money to make money," because that's the only goal I know. Um, and and we as a society honor no, that's not the right word. We um, we sort of tell ourselves that you know those who are rich are the are the most successful. And so it's a really easy trap to get into and it's a really difficult trap to get out of, you know, what is meaningful and purposeful um, for each person is it's like, go, go work on it. It's like, great. I, I have no idea what that looks like. So there are some definite ways to work on meaning and purpose. And in fact, in the book, we go through each of them separately and I give some exercises to start working on purpose and identity specifically. Let me just give you a definition here. You asked about happiness. We don't like the word happiness, right? It's really hard to define. So if you look at Maslow, he talked about self-actualization, right? Maslow's pyramid. If you look at researchers who look at happiness, they'll talk about life evaluation or emotional well-being. I actually like to put it in terms of purpose, identity, and connections. I think our happiest times are when we are working on our purpose, identity, and connections on a regular basis. So a big question I often get is, well, how do I define purpose? How do I know what my purpose is? I have no idea. There's some really simple ways to go through that. And here's another place where I touch on dealing with the dying. When we take care of hospice patients, after we manage their symptoms and get them comfortable and and have them in a safe place, we do something called a a life evaluation um, or a life review is actually the hospice term. And so what a life review is, is a doctor or nurse or chaplain or social worker will sit with a patient and will go through a series of structured questions about their life. Like, what was important to you? What did you accomplish? What didn't you accomplish? What were the key moments in your life? What were the key relationships in your life? What do you regret? If I told you now you have six months to live, what would you wanna accomplish in the next six months to feel like you lived a good life before you die? Why don't we do this every year starting at the age of 20? Like, why do we wait to do this important work when we're dying You want to know what purpose is? What I always tell people is imagine yourself lying in your deathbed, bemoaning your life and saying, I really regret the fact that I never had the energy, courage, or time to. And if you can let go of enough to answer that question truthfully, whatever comes next is your purpose, or at least has a a part of your purpose. And so I really try to get people to visualize this, not to scare them and not to depress them, but the exact opposite. I found that when people are dying, 
it's a horrible, scary thing, right, on one side. But the other side is it releases them from all that societal pressure of trying to be what society wants you to be, trying to achieve what society wants you to achieve. It takes this huge weight off your shoulder and gives you the permission for once in your life to say, this is what I want, unfettered, right? This is what I want. This is that deepest, most inner secret that I've been holding on to that I've been too embarrassed and sh or ashamed to talk about. That's what dying does for us. Why don't we take a lesson from that page book and start doing those things now, or at least coming to terms with them so that we can start saying, okay, this is what purpose in my life looks like. Do you, um, we live in a very low stakes culture. Um, yeah, we're going to die, but we're pretty, but pretty far removed from it on a day-to-day -day basis. The closest we watch is in, you know, movies and TV. Um, not like, say, a, even a short few hundred years ago where starvation, war, famine, disease were real, real threats. Um, now, we don't have to address these problems that much. So we can kind of like, it's very um, Huxleyan where we can kind of just, um, you know, drift through and take our Soma take our little um, anti-anxiety meds or, or smoke some weed and just, um, you know, wait till tomorrow. And then when you said like, hey, when you're on the deathbed, it's like, well, now the stakes are high. Now you can't really push that 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 off anymore. Now you have to address it. And so I think it, maybe it gives people, um, I, I assume it gives them a, a much deeper sense of clarity. Do you, in the book, do you have any exercises that would, I mean, not just ask the question, but maybe like sort of, get somebody in the right mind frame to, to put those stakes, what I consider like put the stakes right and like show like, Hey, this is important to fix now. Cause I agree with you. And, and I think anybody listening would be like, yeah, that is a good point. But how do you, how do you slow your day down and say, oh, I won't take the easy, the easy road. I won't take the, the, the Soma for the night. I'll actually address this difficult problem. So again, you're talking the difference between surviving and thriving, right? Taking the Soma is surviving. It's making through every day. What I'd hopefully like people to do is thrive. So at the end of each chapter, actually, there are a series of exercises that just do exactly that. They start raising the stakes. So after chapter one, it's actually putting you through a life review. If you just got the message that you were dying in six months what kind of things would be important in your life? What would you regret and what would you want to achieve? That carries on with the chapters that follow. Um, I'll give you a few examples. When we talk about work, we do an exercise called the reverse lottery test. So what we do is we have you visualize the fact that you just won the lottery. And then I have you go into your day planner and look at what you have scheduled for the next two weeks. And then I have you systematically strip out those things you wouldn't do if you had $100 million in the bank. And then the process is to now look at your life today and to compare. Like, how much time are you spending doing stuff you don't want to do? How much time are you spending doing things that only money is stopping you from getting out of? The point is to look at your life as it is and start realizing what trade-offs you're making. That doesn't solve all your problems. You might not have enough money to get rid of those things from your life, but then at least you're clear-eyed about what you want to start subtracting. What is the friction in your life? And if you found other paths, for instance, to make money, what would you start getting rid of? So there are a bunch of these actually exercises. Again, there's one after every chapter and all of them make you take a hard look at your life. It's probably one of the hardest parts of the book is these are challenging exercises. These are exercises that really make you look at your life and question, am I doing it right? And how am I going to feel as I get to my later days if I don't start paying attention to these things? Yeah, as you were talking, I scrolled through to the first one, <clears throat> the life review. And uh, I like that in the exercise and the explanation, you're like, if and when you start feeling anxiety, that's normal. Here's how you <laughs> push through it or whatever. Um, I, so I, so for those listening, I, I received a PDF copy ahead of time. So I've I've perused, although admittedly prefer hard copy over PDF. So I'm going to buy the physical and read it thoroughly then, but, uh, it really is outlaid really well. Like I, I it's going to be good to be able to sit down with a piece of paper and go, Oh, 
let me think through exactly this. Hey, uh, Doc G. Um, I'm trying to shamelessly, deeply shamelessly plug this podcast because I believe that it's um, valuable. 10,000 downloads per month these days. Can uh, Do the military members get any discounts on this brand new book that you haven't made any money on yet? <laughs> Well, right now, actually, on pre-order, it's about 10% discounted on Amazon. So we actually decided to only go with paperback with this book, and it is priced at $14.99, which for a new book is pretty much on the low side. So the idea was to price this so that anyone could buy it. The Kindle right now is $12.99. I just finished doing the audio version for Audible, um, and that will be coming out soon too. So all of it is set to drop August 2nd, but if you go pre-order right now, it happens to be cheap on Amazon. Thank you. I saw your post. You, uh, you were doing the recording. Was that at your house? Did you do that at your house? You have a, you have a, no. So we actually, I sold this manuscript to Ulysses press and we bargained to keep the audio rights. So the Ulysses press doesn't own the audio rights. And then we sold the audio rights to audible itself. So Audible was really cool. They actually got me a filmmaker as a producer. And I did the recording at the Chicago Recording Center in the city. It is like, you know, they're like pictures of rock stars and P. Diddy and all those people. They're like, it's a it's a legit recording stereo. So or it's just it's a rigid recording studio. So I uh, I felt like a rock star. But let me tell you also, it's hard to sit for four hours and read. That's not an easy thing, actually. Um, and it was somewhat painful. Yeah, I can you, I'm just curious, personally, like, um, what's that like? I, I mean, you're reading, it's your book. I mean, I'm sure you can put your, you know, passion and personality and maybe a little inflection into it. But also, uh, my guess is you kind of, you have to read it. You can't, you, you can't really have the, com- the dialogue like you normally would with a conversation. Yeah, you can't. And I had a producer and a sound engineer who every time I said something slightly different, were stopping me, stopping me and making me say it over again. The cool part about the book. So this book is set up so that there are some very emotional stories, but there's also some hardcore financial topics in here. So I got to really try to be a voice actor with this one where I needed to emote appropriately for some of these end of life stories that really, you know, were very emotional And yet, on the other hand, I had to talk about the 4% rule in the safe withdrawal rate because there were, even though, you know, this is a financial book, there is real financial discussion here, real financial information, but it is highly colored with my experiences of dealing with the dying and the philosophy that informs the financial decisions. Because to me, the philosophy is really the big part of the conversation that marries to the financial information as well as the stories of the dying and my own story of burning out in medicine. So it's all kind of intertwined, but it made it for an interesting recording because I, in a sense, had to change personas from time to time to get the emotion right. That's fun. So uh, I just pre-ordered while we were talking. And uh, also I applaud you for doing that in one sitting. I, when I recorded mine, it was a chapter a day and it was exhausting partially because I, I read fast and I talk fast. And so I had to intentionally slow down. So I felt like I was, you know, I also listened to audiobooks at like two and a half times speed, two times speed. So I was like, I'm like reading it out loud, like, and then the, you know, it was, it was painful. So I, I would do like a chapter and then call it for the night. Cause I was doing it in my house. So we did four hours at a time and it was three sessions. Um, so it wasn't all at once, but I'm really excited. And you'll hear it first here. Vicki Robin, who wrote my forward is actually going to do the audible reading too. That's so in a few cool. days, she's actually audible paid for her to go to the studio and she's going to be recording the forward, which will be part of the audio book. So. Are you in Chicago or did you have to travel? So I am in the suburbs. So it was a good 45 minute drive and, and about 40 bucks of parking, but they pay for that. So it's not too I'm bad. A, I'm going to be there in next, uh, next week for four days. So I may have to hit you up. Oh, sweet. Hit me did up. You, yeah, uh, you needed sure. a photo shoot for this. You needed a, uh, didn't you? This, did we talk about this? We did. And I, I talked about doing it with you instead of doing a photo shoot. I decided to do a book trailer. So I put some time and energy and money into doing a professional book trailer because I wanted to get a real shareable version of both audio and video that encapsulated this, you know, 60,000 word book, 
in just a minute or a minute and a half. And I found that the emotion as well as the information, I couldn't pair it any better any other way than doing a book tour. Are you going to do, um, is there any, are you going to do a book tour by any chance? I'm doing little bits. So I am going to, we are doing a book launch party at Longmont at the Mr. Money Mustache headquarters on August 19th. And then I'm going to be in San Diego for a Camp Fi. So I'll probably do something there. And I'll probably do an event in Chicago, but I'm not ready to do like a series of weeks and weeks of travel. I just, I have kids. They're just starting. My daughter's just starting high school. My son is going to be in his senior year. We've got, my wife is, is working with her parents to get them moved. We've got all sorts of life stuff going on too. So I just, I, I couldn't dedicate that time. And the truth of the matter is, you know, book tours are fun to see people, but they don't really sell a lot of books. It's more just kind of a victory lap than I was. Um, else. It was not about you. It was only about me. I'm just looking for fun life <laughs> events to photo and video of my friends and tell stories. That's all. It's not, it wasn't about you. I'm, yeah. Come to long. Yeah. Long. Well, uh, that's where my, uh, our good friend Mindy lives. So I might, uh, I might, I might, I might, I might do that. Yeah. There's going to be a bunch of people there um, just from the community. Carl and Mindy will be there. Uh, Pete, Mr. Money Mustache will be there. Um, Leaf Darlene, the physician on fire, is going to be in town with his wife and kids. So uh, a lot of people there. All right. So we, as as much as I could chat about book and producing and, and launching and all of that, I find, I think that the, if we go back to the content a little bit, it'll probably be uh, infinitely more valuable. So in the beginning of the book, you talk about, uh, you know, the two stories of dying in America, right? And, and essentially the, the nutshell is uh, you paint the picture of two individuals passing away. One has a ton of money and didn't focus on much else. And the other has essentially no money and focused on, you know, had a, had a loving wife and a, and relationship. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it's, it's true, right? It seems like, and I, people get to the end and, you know, they regret one way or the other, but it, having been in hospice, you've had a very unique perspective on this because most people, even in the service, the actual interactions with people who are dying are very minimal, right? Unless it's a, a close relative, like it's either somebody did pass away that you knew and you didn't really have the interactions or it's somebody that you knew, but, um, so you have a really unique perspective on this, getting to see that. What are some of the common, like, do you, is, are there trends or there common things that you have gained from that? Yeah. So a few things. One is almost no one ever says, I regret that I didn't work more nights and weekends. Right. I never, I never hear that one on the deathbed. Almost no one ever says, you know, I had this net worth goal of a million dollars and I only made it to 500,000. Like no one says that either. Generally people, if they do regret something, it's that they didn't do the things that were most important to them. Right. There were things in their life that they kept on putting off because they were afraid or because they were difficult or because they were embarrassing, even though they were important to them. And so that's what people end up really regretting. It's the relationships. It's those important activities. Sometimes it's a hobby. Sometimes it's a bucket list item that they just never got around to doing. Um, it's those things that they never had the courage to do. Right. And so you hear this over and over and over again. Um, and most people just say they always thought they had more time. Like it's, it's a common refrain. It's like, I'm not going to do this right now because it's hard and I have so much more time. Uh, and at some point your time runs out and we never know when that's going to be. Right. Um, but there's a message in that. And the message is if this thing was so important to me on my deathbed, maybe it's very meaningful for me even before that. And like, Again, it's one of those great concentrators where it helps you concentrate on what really matters in life. Maybe we need to spend a lot more time on that, regardless of the outcome, right? No one, no one ever complains about failing on their deathbed. They complain about not trying, right? So I had a guy in his 40s I took care of who went and took a year off in his 20s to climb Mount Everest. And he you know, he stopped working. He had to live really frugally just to train. He had very little money, but he's like, this is important to me. Little did he know that in his forties, he would be dying of leukemia. You know, he never made it to the top of Everest. Like 
the weather changed. They had to go back down and then his time was gone and he had to go back home. But during his hospice days, he would tell us about trying to climb Everest and what it felt like and how precious those memories were. It's not the succeeding or failing, it's the trying. And so I think we need to learn how to have that courage to try those things that are deeply important to us. Bro, this podcast hits hard. Yeah, wow. Uh, I think that That's, I, I think I think there's something like with investing. It's a calculation of risk. It's not anything to really be feared about. In fact, that was when I, when I was in um, when I was in risk analysis for the bank. I always just say risk is never to be feared, always measured. And I think you know people. Some people are more or less neurotic than others, and those who are neurotic have a difficult time investing. But the reality is, um, as you said from the start, this whole financial thing is like it's like a it's like a spreadsheet problem. You know, you save X, you invest it in Y, it's going to make Z, you know, return. And it's like, if you, if you do that long enough, it kind of like, you know, Buffett's a good example. He's like, I'm not the best investor of all time. I've just been doing it longer than everybody else. Um, and, but it doesn't, you, you have to try a little bit, but there's things that are much far, far, far scarier and far more rewarding. Um, and I'm guilty myself, but I'm pretty freaking fearless and there's things that i i don't do all the time because i'm afraid and um it's very you know eats at me and uh you know now that i'm here and you know now we're doing this podcast i'm gonna scoop this book up right away and it's something i know i need to overcome and now i'm all the more i'm all the more uh, motivated because i know that this is a problem a mistake i'm making i know it's a problem that other people um are making and probably don't even address it enough so I mean, you are speaking my language right now. Mm. I love how you talk about your monetary investments. What people forget is that what's also important is our non-monetary investments, which also compound similar to our monetary. So we need to learn to invest in education. We need to learn how to invest in self-forgiveness. We need to learn how to invest in the people around us. We need to learn how to invest in things that are purposeful and if you do that at a young age, those things will compound and bring you wealth far ahead of the kind of wealth that we're talking about when it comes to cash. Um, you can use the same words, the same concepts work, but we've ignored a lot of those non-monetary investments, sometimes because we're so caught up in the monetary ones. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, so uh, for the last five, six years, I've, when I come to a decision, like a crossroads and I don't really know which way to go, I've tried to put it in the frame of which would I, which of these am I more likely to regret when I'm, you know, and the, the funny thing is that that idea actually came from a way that I was told to sell, uh, people on the Marine Corps when I was a recruiter was because I had someone come to me and was like, Hey, I was like, how do, you know, all these kids are are interested and then their girlfriend doesn't want them to, their parents don't want them to join the military, you know, whoever talks them out of it. I was like, how do you overcome? Like, well, your parents don't know what they're talking about is not exactly the answer. <laughs> and this guy who'd been a recruiter for, you know, 15, 16 years was like, well, just ask them to sit down without their parents around and say, 40 years from now, are you more likely to regret joining the military and hating it, getting out and doing something else or never joining the military and not knowing and, you know, and like to journal it out. And so I've tried to put that spin on a lot of these decisions. And obviously it's not the same as actually being at the end, but it's a really good way to think through big decisions, you know, like, because you just, a lot of times you get wrapped in, like, it's easy to get lost in the short-term gain, right? It, it's, it's, it's the long game is what matters. And it's, you know, at the end of the day, like the, the further along I get financially, the more I realize it doesn't matter. <laughs> like it, eh. you reach a point, you're like, OK, oh, shoot. Now I got to focus on other things. You know what I love? I love that mechanism of, of, of writing down the regrets and kind of journaling, journaling it and thinking about it. I also like doing the opposite. Like if you're questioning whether I should go to the military or not, like I'm going to count to three. And at three, I'm going to tell you something, and I want you to give me your immediate reaction. One, two, three, you can't join the military. 
and see like, what is the immediate reaction? Like, take it away. And then that tells you a lot, right? If all of a sudden your heart like jumps and goes, oh shoot, I really wanted to do it. Then you know. Whereas if someone says you can't go to the military and they're like, oh, thank God. Then you're like, okay, now you know the other way, right? That's smart. That's real smart. Yeah, I love that actually. It's like one, two, three, you just lost that thing you were about to bid on. How do you feel? Now, how do we get a trick like that that works on getting my wife to decide where she wants dinner? <laughs> Those are the real complicated. You questions. can't have tacos. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I figured that one out, I'd be much more successful in life. Um, Doc, I um, interesting thing, you know, we talk about philosophy. I read a lot of philosophy, as David alluded to earlier. Um, a lot of dead philosophers, because I think um, something, something about um, ancient wisdom or wisdom that has stood the test of time, rather. Um, has more value. There's not a there's not a philosopher I've read yet, not new, not old, that has ever said money is. They've never mentioned money as the part of the equation that lives an honorable, um, purposeful, meaningful life. It's always, in fact, that when they do bring it up, it's always the opposite. So, do you have any opinions on like why we are so in this culture so reversed, like di- directly opposed, where we don't spend any time teaching, thinking, or uh, uh, about like purpose, meaning, like you said, or we don't really spend a lot of time valuing, like you said, like self investment, reflection, um, um, introspection. These are not words that are used often or encouraged. Um, it's always make money, buy iPads. Um, why are we so so far uh, reversed? That's because it's measurable and demonstrable. Like, so talking about, am I living a life of purpose? Have I connected to my identity? Someone can't really look at me and see that. But you sure as hell can see me pull up in my $100,000 car, wearing my bling and having a Gucci bag, right? Like, wealth is very measurable, very demonstrable. We can look at a person and say they're worth this many millions, or they must be worth this many millions to own these these type of things. And what does our life become, right? If you look at social media, if you look at media in general, these these snapshots. So it's hard to take a snapshot and say, ah, that guy's in touch with his identity and purpose. But it is easy to take a snapshot and say, wow, that guy has a lot of money. Um, And so I I think that's, I think it's the, again, it's the easy stuff, low hanging fruit. It may not be easy to make 10 or $20 million, but you sure know how, like we all know how we might succeed. We might not succeed. We might not be willing to go through the work that it'll take, but any of us, especially after studying for a little while can sit down and go, okay, I'm going to pick a real estate strategy. And this is how I'm going to get to 10 or 20 million through real estate. I'm going to pick an entrepreneurial strategy. And this is how I'm going to build a business that's worth that. I'm going to go and work and save 75% of my income. I'm going to invest it aggressively. And after 20 years, here's how I'm going to hit 10 million. We all can do that. Um, It's really hard to take someone and say, okay, I want you to live a life full of meaning and purpose. I want you to not just utilize one tool in your life, which is money, but I want you to utilize all the different tools, your intelligence, your time, your love, your respect, your connections to other people. I want to see what self-actualization looks like when you're using everything to be the person you were meant to be. How the heck do we show that in a snapshot? How do we post that on social media and Instagram and TikTok in a 30 second clip? Well, it's interesting. We don't. Uh, Alex, you know, talks about philosophers and, and a lot of what we just alluded to or said kind of ties back into status right and the funny thing is when you think back to the philosophers some of them had status but a lot of the a lot of them were you know guys who kind of stayed back and and thought and you know whatever um you're right it's it's you know we are driven a lot of times by things like monetary is is a status thing F sports athleticism is a, it can be a status thing. Like not to say that that's necessarily the driving factor, but you know, it's, I, I mean, I see it in my own life. If I have a, a measurable goal, right. That's what you're supposed to have, right. A measurable, your goal should be measurable. But if you have a measurable goal that you are striving for, it is way easier to be motivated to do that thing every day than it is. Like if I just say, Hey, I'm going to get in shape. That's one thing. But if I'm like, I'm going to run a half Ironman next August, like that's a completely different level of commitment to training. And so 
I guess it kind of begs the question is, is there a way to try to gamify or, or uh, measure purpose identity? I mean, you're right. That's not a like. Yes, I have, I have a very definite answer to that. Let me just say one thing, cause I want to say this about status, um, something fun from the book. The last or one of the last chapters of the book is investing tips from a hospice doctor. And almost all of these are non-monetary investments. And one of the things I caution against is we shouldn't invest or worship in the false gods. And status is one of the false gods. And a lot of people question whether status is important to them. And one of the exercises is to imagine that in a hundred years, no one will know anything about you, what you did, what you produced, your life will mean nothing in a hundred years. How does that make you feel? If that makes you really anxious, then status is really important to you. And you have to question what that means to you. If it doesn't make you anxious, then status probably doesn't matter much to you. Um, so you were saying, how do we measure identity and purpose what I believe happiness or whatever we want to call happiness truly looks like is something that I call in the book, the climb, right? And it's exactly what it sounds like. I think we were most happy when we're engaged in an activity that is challenging, that is highly meaningful to us, that we enjoy doing it for the sake of doing it. I always talk about podcasting. Like I have goals of having a million downloads a month to my podcast. It'll probably never happen. And I probably have very little control over that. But I podcast most days of the week. I record with people all the time. And I love recording with people so much that even if I never got another listener, I would probably still do it. So the climb is being engaged in something difficult that is meaningful to you, that you enjoy the process. And last but not least, that you can make some incremental gain. So I'll probably never hit a million downloads a month, but maybe if I have... 10,000 downloads and I can make it to 10,100 in six months or 10,500 in seven months, I'm making gain. And that's happiness. Happiness is being involved in a meaningful climb that you enjoy doing in which you feel like you're making some headway. That's it. I was just gonna say, that's it. No more, no less. That, that to is me my, is happiness. That is almost my verbatim definition of purpose. Yeah. yeah. Find a yeah. challenge that you enjoy the, ch uh, find a, uh, an activity you enjoy the continued challenge of something like that. Like, and I'd almost say that it can be very disconcerting to hit your final goal because then you have to question where you go next. So I, I always say this to my kids, which people laugh at is I tell my kids, may you never reach your ultimate goal, but maybe get 90% there because part of life is dreaming about that little last bit that you can't quite get to. It's part of happiness. Actually. Let me, I'm going to throw maybe a curveball at you. Some people like me have highly addictive personalities. And so I find myself on the hedonic treadmill um, of almost everything I do very rapidly. I, I get on this like, Hey, uh, yeah, I get it. I'll hit a goal. And then it's like, I got to have that next fix. I got to have that next fix. I got to have that next fix. And it can be very, it, it, it can be very, um, I can use it in a useful way if I find productive things to get addicted to and very unproductive if I find you know, <laughs> everything else. Um, do you, do, is that part of, of your research in this book? Have you thought about that? Have you been down that road at all? Yes. In fact, I am an overachiever and I've been on the achievement treadmill most of my life. My answer to that, especially if you have the space in your life where you have enough money and you've accomplished, like I can look at my life and say, okay, I've kind of accomplished enough, right? Like it's, it'd be great if this book becomes a bestseller. It'd be great if my podcast gets more listeners, but ultimately in the end, none of that's going to really make me happier. It's just going to be another accolade. So here's the question. You know, you've gone too far when you no longer enjoy the process, like it's great and you're having fun and this feels good. And then you're like, but I have to go higher. And it starts feeling stressful and painful and not fun anymore. And that's how you know that your climb has taken a wrong turn. And I think we have to be ever vigilant of that because ultimately, again, this idea that we become achievement junkies. And for some people that could look like a purposeful life, but for most people, it feels like being strung out on drugs. It, it feels painful and difficult. And so if you're one of those people who this feels painful and difficult, you have to step back from the ultimate goal and keep on coming back to, am I enjoying what I'm doing today? 
Am I enjoying on being this on this part of the climb? And if the answer is no, then you probably have to pick a different mountain. I would love if our listeners, if anybody's feeling that way, if they're they're doing well, maybe they're in real estate, they're investing, whatever it is, the military, they're doing well, but they feel like they're going down the wrong road and they're just doing it because that's the only thing they know. I would love to have that conversation. Um, reach out to me, David, whatever. But I mean, while we're on this topic, I know that the people are going to relate to this idea and they're going to feel like, yeah, I- I'm succeeding. I'm succeeding by maybe some societal measurable standard, but not, but I'm not, I don't feel successful. I feel maybe miserable, maybe. Sorry. I was just going to say, I'd love to give away a book to that person. So if you decide you want to get someone on the podcast to talk about a goal that they feel stuck in or that it's not, not fulfilling their needs. I love to send them a copy of the book and have them take a look at it. I wish that you could just like build a time machine and take us back like six months and give me this exact talk. Um, for those of the <laughs> list, the listeners who've been kind of hearing, yeah, you know, I haven't gone into the weeds yet cause it's not totally closed up, but the listeners have heard basically that I was building this wholesaling company and, and I brought somebody in who's a friend to help me scale it. I only ever really wanted to do like a deal or two a month so that I had some good discounts. He wanted to scale. I was like, let's scale more money. And you know, the, the roads diverged and once everything's like actually finalized and whatever will, uh, I'll probably tell the whole story, but the biggest part is that, the last few months as that thing was growing and scaling, it was just like, man, day in, day out, this thing's stressing me out. It's taking me away from what I want to be doing. It's, you know, and it took me a long time to decide to shut it down and sell the company. Uh, So that's some really good advice. One of the things that I've been kind of in the same vein uh, trying to do, so I'm trying to really scale back and like I said, focus on the things that are more fulfilling. So one of the things that I've been doing is when an opportunity arises, I will, automatically schedule it on a repeating weekly call and I will know two or three weeks down the road, I'll know if it's something I need to keep doing because two or three weeks down the road, when that call pops up on my calendar and I go, Oh, immediately I'm like, Nope, (laughs) there's the answer. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a weird Mm. place to be in. And I don't want to, I don't want people to think that we should avoid all pain. Sometimes pain is necessary. That patient Ernesto who I was talking about climbing Mount Everest, he had to endure tons of pain getting up at five in the morning to train every day for months and months and months before he went. And he didn't love the training. He loved the climbing. Um, but pain can be in service to something that's important. The point is to be intentional so that that sacrifice or pain is really fulfilling that sense of identity and purpose. If it's not, then it's pain for pain's sake. And that's what we really got to get yeah, rid or of. pain for somebody else's sake. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of societal pressure and there's a lot of, um, especially like right now in real estate, because there's been so much mania. I, I don't know how deep you are into real estate, um, doc, but like the real estate market in the last year has gone in bananas. And then there's this whole like, sick 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 culture around it where it's like you better get in you gotta you gotta it's all this pressure and this that as prices are going up and so there's a lot of pressure on people to like to do things that they um that i know that they often don't feel comfortable about and i also know that i mean i know the profit margins are shrinking so i'm like you're 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 getting all this social pressure and then you're making actually less money and, and you're kind of forcing it and so i know um you know there's people that are going through pain of trying to do things that they um that are difficult and they they don't they don't actually want to do and they're not they're not happy like you said going through the um they're not happy going through the process and that really is it it's it's not about avoiding pain it's about fighting the pain you enjoy i i mean i'm that's what i think i mean it's your book i don't mean to. <laughs> all right so doc want to be respectful of your time do have a couple questions and then a uh a shameless plug slash invitation for you um, that fits in with this topic, actually, I think, which is why I'm going to do it, even though Alex and I hate when people plug on the show, including us, but we're going to do it anyway, because it's for Alex and Dave. So uh, that being said, uh, before we get to that, what are, I mean, there's no way to be like, what's your number one tip for life? But like having, you know, in the, in the context of this book and, and what we've talked about today, what do you think are one or two of the biggest 
things that you see people regret that might be worth saying, hey, you should really sit down and try to think through. If you think through just this this one thing, you'll be way further along than if you push that, you know, kick that can down the road for 40 years. Yeah, I, I think the synopsis of the book is actually fairly straightforward. It's one, consider identity and purpose first. Like, that's the first thing you need to think about. Two, then build your financial framework. And three, something we didn't talk about, but also is important, decide whether you're afraid that you are going to die young and wealthy, never enjoying your money, or you're going to die old and broke. What scares you more? And once you answer that question, it'll really help you decide how much you can spend today versus how much you have to defer gratification and save for the future. So I think those are the three really main big pieces. But to anyone, I would say the dying have taught me that we need to really start thinking about purpose and identity, doing the hard work now instead of putting it off. Say that exercise again, please. So what scares you more, dying young and broke, or excuse me, dying young and wealthy and never enjoying life, or dying old and broke and not having enough money to live out your later years? And here's the why this is important. At some point, we all get to that place in our financial path where we're like, I want to be present and enjoy today. And sometimes that takes spending money. On the other hand, I also want to be smart about my future and retire one day and have enough money to live to my 80s and 90s and not worry about it. And people get caught up on, okay, how much can I put towards YOLO today versus how much do I have to defer gratification and save for if you ask yourself what scares you more, it actually answers the question for you. So an example is my dad died at 40 and he actually had a premonition he was going to die. So he told my mom this. He said, I'm going to die young. You just need to know this. But he lived his life like someone who knew he was going to die at 40. I mean, he spent money. He didn't save a lot. He made work choices based on his enjoyment as opposed to the pay. He had all sorts of hobbies when he died, the, he hadn't saved much for retirement. He had a life insurance policy to help us and all that kind of stuff. But because dying young was his biggest fear, he lived in the moment a lot more. So someone like that should put a lot more money in their YOLO form, fund and put a lot less in the retirement. On the other hand, someone like me, I figure I'm going to live a long life. I don't mind grinding it out and working really hard. So at young ages, instead of having a big YOLO fund, I put almost everything into retirement because I figured I'd be able to YOLO after I retired and I'd be living lots of years. So I wanted my money to compound. What's great about this exercise is if you're wrong, there are very few consequences. If you are young and you're afraid you're going to die early and you do a lot of YOLO and you don't save a lot for retirement, but still have a plan towards financial independence, if you end up living longer than you thought, no big deal. You just don't retire until you're older. But in the meantime, you're spending lots of money on doing what you want today. And so I think that's a win-win. And that's why that question is so important. It helps you toggle between YOLO and deferred gratification, especially in these younger years, so we can decide how much do we need to spend and how much do we need to save and give us our permission to enjoy the moment when it's, you know, the right thing to do. I'm very glad that you asked for clarification, Alex, because that was, that was good. This podcast hits hard. <laughs> uh, yeah. I hate to say it, but that's the idea of the book. This is not supposed to be light reading. Um, this book is supposed to challenge you to really ask the hard questions. And so if you're looking for some light enjoyment reading, I hate to tell someone not to buy my book because I really want lots of people to buy it. But this is not a light read. This is supposed to make you think. You know, Goodnight Moon probably hasn't changed too many people's lives. So <laughs> I hate light reading, so I'm buy a yeah. copy. Don't worry. Yeah, I yeah, awesome. already ordered it. All right, here's the shameless plug and the invite. Uh, we're talking about life and things outside of money that are important. Alex and I have been talking about doing an event for a long time. And by the time this episode airs, all of the details should be available and out there. And we are going to be the first week in December. We are going to be doing a four-night trip to Guatemala. We have room for 11 people. It's not going to be the cheapest thing in the world. We're looking somewhere between three and 3,500. And, uh, but that'll be all inclusive other than flights, which are pretty reasonable. And we're going to, we're going to hike a volcano and sleep at 12,000 feet and watch the volcano go off at night and come back down. And we're going to go to a, stay in some casitas that are boat access only and a really gnarly Airbnb with a rooftop pool and hot tub on the house and have a 
steak dinner cooked at the house and do craft cocktail classes and ride tuk tuks around. And uh, we sat through with the lady who's helping us plan it. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And then she's like, next slide. I'm like, oh, that's cool. She's like, next slide. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so to be, it's going to be good. And to be clear, we did this because um, – we, we've been going to conferences for a long time, and we found out real early on that the information at the conferences on how to get wealthy is not what's most valuable. What's most valuable is exactly what Jordan is talking about. It's finding social. It's finding people that you, that your, your community. It's finding a lot about yourself. It's in, it's in going to travel. It's in investing in, in your life experience. And so when we get down there, I'm just saying it out right now. This is not a mastermind. There will be zero content there. We are not teaching you nothing on how to do nothing. We are going to, uh, we want to encourage people to invest just like this is perfect timing. Um, we want to, we want people to invest in their life experiences. And that's, you know, I, there's few things better that have taught me who I am more than travel. And, um, and g going on a 16 mile hike up a vol volcano is, is pretty, is up in the top, definitely in the top 10. So, um, how do you feel about that, Doc G? Does that sound like, that sound like a good, so a way to, to, is that a good spend of some capital? Yes. Yes, for sure. All right. Oh, all right. We got the improvement. Good job, baby. Now it's time to shamelessly plug. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm not even going to shamelessly plug it. I'll, I'll tell them where to, where to share it and, and where people can get a hold of it. But Alex and I on the podcast have both pre-ordered the book. So you should probably get moving uh, because this is, if you, if you didn't get something out of this podcast, then. Well, uh, hopefully your hospice experience when you get to a lot older is is better than the forecast says. So uh, you should this this has been a phenomenal episode that I've gotten a ton out of. And Doc, where I mean, we mentioned Amazon and Audible. Are those the best places to grab the book, or is there another landing yeah. page? The easy way is is to go to Amazon, but wherever you buy books, especially online, Target, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, wherever it is, at all those places. If you want to catch up with me, there are two easy places that you get all the information about this as well as can link to the book. JordanGrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. Or my podcast is EarnAndInvest.com. Either of those, easy to get all the information you need about me and the book. Dude. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been good. Yeah, big thank you. Uh, it's I knew I knew sitting down it would be an amazing conversation because those are the kind of conversations I always have with you guys anyway. So well, and and I know we said before recording that I wasn't going to cry, but I don't know if you caught it. Alex's <laughs> camera cut off for a little while there, so I'm not saying he cried, but the you're world not saying he cried, but know. it's possible. <laughs> Uh, you have no proof though. So, <laughs> um, doc G thank you so much. I can't say it enough. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from military to millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to millionaire.com slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show. Give us a review on iTunes. Now get out there and take action.